Sometimes a game comes along that's so unique, so engaging, so emotionally investing that it's worth making a challenge run of it even though it'll probably tank the channel because barely anyone's ever played it. Don't worry though, no story spoilers here. Welcome to RPG Challenge Runs and today we ask ourselves, can you beat Fuga Melodies of Steel without skills, battle items or the Soul Ganon? To make the run as difficult as possible, we'll be taking the highest difficulty paths all the way, and as always, no glitches, mods, etc. Let's do it. While the tutorial section plays out, let's just take a second to summarise what's even going on in this game. Well, we're playing as a ragtag bunch of orphaned animals aboard a tank the size of a medium sized apartment block. We can have three assigned gunners, each supported by a second character, for a total of six active combatants. As the story progresses and the party grows, we'll end up having extras in reserve for when some of them inevitably get knocked out. It's a clever spin on the traditional RPG party system, especially considering the gunners are split into three groups. Blue machine gunners, yellow grenade launcherers, and red cannon shooters. Wait, cannone cannoneers? Is that a word? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, cannons deal heavy damage while having low accuracy against flyers, machine guns have low damage but high accuracy, and grenade launchers are kind of a mix of the two. You can delay enemy turns by destroying their clock symbols, just attack them with the same colour weapon. Clocks then replenish after the enemy's next turn. It sounds complicated at first, but it's fairly easy to figure out after just a few minutes of gameplay. I'm sure those of you who've never played the game before are already starting to get the hang of it now just from watching this tutorial footage. Oh, full disclaimer, we are forced to use one skill and the permadeath inducing soul cannon during this tutorial section, but the game later forces you to reload from the previous checkpoint so I'm not counting it as a fail. But from this point on, all skills and battle items are banned. It becomes immediately obvious from the fight against the game's first boss, Colonel Pretzel here, that healing is going to be the biggest challenge of this run, since restorative skills and items are the only two methods of healing our tank mid-combat. Well, I say only, but there is actually a sneaky third healing option, which comes from having Hannah here placed in a supporting role. By teaming her up with speedy machine gunner Kyle, we've now got ourselves a tiny yet not insignificant amount of passive healing whenever Kyle uses a basic attack. It's definitely not enough to sustain us throughout longer encounters though, so we'll need to stay on the offensive. While we're talking about team composition, here is a list of what each party member does while in a support role, as well as what their hero mode ability does when they're the ones doing the shooting. But more on that second part a bit later. Some of these effects will be useless for this run, mainly because they involve buffing skill usage in some way, while other effects are just kind of meh. These ones, however, are incredibly overpowered, so I'm pretty confident in saying that this starting team will be the best setup for our entire run. We died more than a few times against this first boss, and since grinding is impossible in this game, we just have to keep bashing our metaphorical head against the wall until we can progress. We have used the intermission time to upgrade our weapons and armour, as well as ranking up a couple of our Persona style social links, so we really are as strong as we can be. The problem is that Pretzel's turret persistently heals the main body, and bosses in this game are incredibly <laughs> tanky. <laughs> okay, I promise not to use that joke again. Six minutes in and link attacks are now online, which are powerful moves made available by gunners having high affinity with their respective support partners. Since Kyle and Hannah's link attack can restore a good chunk of HP while dealing massive damage to all targets, it's worth using whenever our health gets reasonably low. The downside is that this move has an insanely long cooldown. I think it's based on how much damage you deal and receive, as well as the character's affinity levels, but I'm sure someone will correct me in the comments section. A few more minutes later and things are not looking good as the turret comes back online and we're sitting at a dangerously low 426 health. We defend its persecution and chip down the turret's health, but it's just not enough. There's only one thing for it. We need to try some more. After a lot more failed attempts, we finally have this run. Regular viewers will know that I'm not one to toot my own horn, but I'm pretty proud of how this went. We've memorised his attack rotations and defend accordingly, getting that perfect balance of offence and defence. We obviously take the turret out first to prevent it from healing the main body, but we do suffer a persecution in the process. We don't have any of the aforementioned hero mode abilities available yet, again more on those a bit later, so we just have to keep our eyes glued to the turn order bar at the top of the screen while repeatedly denting his pain work. 
It took a whopping seven and a half minutes, but Sox finally lands the killing blow. Job done. That's one chapter in the bag. In between chapters we get to visit a village where generous locals give us free stuff. Sometimes they'll give us ingredients to cook meals, but mostly they just give us battle items which are obviously banned by the rules. Thankfully we've now unlocked the farm and can grow our own ingredients too. That just leaves a bit of time to raise some affinities, do a bit of scrap fishing for weapon upgrade materials and we're back on our merry way. Enemies here are more varied but still very weak, with most requiring two shots to take down. When we encounter the split in the path we choose the normal rather than the safe route in order to make things as difficult as possible. This usually awards more XP and items anyway, so I'd recommend never choosing the safe path if you're new to the game. We do encounter this weird Beyblade style tank which has three armour stacks, basically additional defence, and we can't lower its armour with Kyle because we're not allowed to use any skills. As you can see it takes a lot longer to take down armoured enemies, which is exactly why we have Boron here on the main cannon, you'll see why in a bit. More areas of the tank get unlocked as we continue upgrading our weapons. What's even better though is that we can now cook! Nice! While the attack and crit rate buffs would be nice, we instead go for the experience and affinity buffs. We'll keep choosing that option for the entire run in an attempt to stay ahead of the curve in terms of level requirement. You can have multiple meals active at once, but each round of cooking uses 3 action points and we only have 20 per intermission, so we have to be selective. After raising a few more social links, it's time for the second main story boss. I love how all the enemy tanks look like actual dogs. <laughs> Alright, this orange guy isn't split up into multiple parts like the last boss was, so we'll just keep gunning for him directly. The issue is that he's fast and has pretty high damage output. We're saving our link attacks for now because Sox's link attack raises the other character's link attack bars, meaning we should use Kyle and Hannah's healing one first and then replenish it using Sox. The boss has raised its cannon though, meaning it's now raining shells on us from above, reducing the accuracy of two of our party members. Okay, it's definitely time to heal up. Things get pretty crazy and it starts rapid fire machine gunning seven shells on us before reverting to its original position. Both tanks are at a bit more than half health now, so it's pretty neck and neck. A few minutes later and it's back to spear raining us, but once again Sox is there to land the killing blow. Job done. It's in the wasteland of chapter 3 that we're introduced to two new party members, Chick and Hack, who, as previously mentioned, aren't particularly helpful in this challenge run. They do bring hero mode with them though, basically if you fill a character's request during an intermission, their mood gradually increases as fights drag on, eventually automatically triggering their hero mode, which is in most cases a buff to their basic attacks. Hero mode will be essential for this run going forward, so we'll need to make sure that we'll always be fulfilling whatever requests our three gunners give us. We also get to explore some ruins here, which are like fun little puzzle dungeons that are a nice change of pace. We can pick up a lot of crafting materials in these places, so they're worth doing. Shortly afterwards, we encounter our first dangerous route. Ho oh, ho ho! These routes typically offer the best rewards, but can be incredibly difficult, almost always involving a tough mini-boss style enemy in the final wave. I mean, look at this guy, is his health bar even moving? Time for this chapter's boss, or rather boss duo, Baum and Stolen, which I'm probably not even pronouncing correctly. We prioritise attacking the flyer first, since I'm pretty sure he can heal the one on the ground, but he has a ton of health. Thankfully, Boron and Malt's link attack deals massive damage, meaning it's now almost half dead. It shrouds itself, increasing its evasion, meaning Machine Gunner Kyle is now the only one who can reliably damage the thing. Two minutes into the fight and they use their first ultimate ability, Checkmate, which absolutely devastates our tank, which is called the Tyrannus by the way, I probably should have mentioned that earlier. Anyway, we're prompted to use the Soul Cannon where you can permanently sacrifice a party member to one shot a boss, but of course that's banned by the rules. It feels like we're making very little progress here and both enemies are hitting hard, so yep, dead. 
Thankfully, the second attempt goes much better. Things start out similar to the first attempt, but the flyer is late using Shroud, so we take advantage of Sock's hero mode to inflict it with a random status ailment. In this case, burn. All it can do is a last ditch heal of his buddy on the ground before succumbing to the damage over time. Cannoneer Boron's hero mode meanwhile removes all armour and all clocks from his target, meaning the second half of this boss duo is an absolute joke. Nice. Chapter 4 Serenade for the Doll Here we grab another new party member Sheena who has some good skills and SP restoration options but obviously none of that is relevant to this run so she'll be taking a permanent back seat. The enemies are easy enough though, so we soon arrive at the boss, which is this, like, how would you even describe this? Basically, it's got a boatload of armour and these two flyers can infinitely heal the thing. Needless to say, they need to be taken out first. What's cool about this boss is when it opens up, massively lowering its defence in favour of offence, including charging up its huge birther attack which we definitely need to defend against. But yeah, even its most powerful ability is only hitting us for like 800 damage, which Kyle and Hannah can easily heal back up, so it's a pretty easy 5 minute fight. Definitely the easiest boss so far. Our adventure continues to the mining area of Shetland, where we team up with the latest party member, Jin. Again, neither his support passive nor his hero mode are particularly strong, so he'll be sitting in reserve too. Enemies are now more numerous and generally more heavily armoured. Dangerous routes are starting to offer a bit of a challenge now, such as this battle which pits us against two upgraded versions of that Beyblade style tank from earlier. But still, we push on through. Here's our setup going into the Chapter 5 boss fight. Our weapons and armour are level 7, but we've prioritised cranking the cannon up to level 8 since that's the one with the highest damage output. We just leave the reactor at level 1 for now since we don't need any SP. Let's go. This massive red monstrosity is piloted by Flam of the Burman Empire and is basically a reskin of the boss we fought back in Chapter 1. It's crucial that we keep the turret down as it can heal the main body for about 700 per turn, which means the fight can sometimes feel like you're going round and round in circles and making no progress. It's only when hero mode becomes active that we can truly push the offensive, with Boron eliminating its 5 layers of armour and despite its retaliatory persecutions, our link attacks continue to hit hard. But can we take her all the way down before she can heal back up? Well in short, yes. That's another boss beaten on the first try, nice. Another chapter, another useless party member. Well, eh, uh, eh, Wappa is okay, but definitely no better than our existing roster, so we'll just keep her on the bench too. We raise some social links and cook more XP boosting food, but we don't have enough materials to further upgrade our weapons yet. Oh, by the way, I probably should have mentioned at the start for those who haven't played this game before, sadly there's no English voice option. Yeah, personally, I'm someone who normally plays with the English dub. <laughs> alright, alright, put your pitchforks down. Uh, but I thought that's worth mentioning because this game's quite expensive and very rarely on sale. And I know the lack of English can be a real deal breaker for some people, so I'd recommend only splashing out in this game if you can put up with the characters only speaking Japanese or French for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure about that one. Oh, and before we do the boss, full disclaimer, Sox here had a request to upgrade the reactor, which obviously we had to fulfil in order to use his hero mode, so that's why we've increased our max SP even though we don't need it. Okay, let's see what weird contraption they have for us this time. Ah yes, the big drill tank. I'll keep this one short because this boss is an absolute cakewalk. Basically, it has one decent move, charging up and then throwing out its drill which injures all party members, but after that it barely does anything of note. Despite summoning two flyers to help out, we take the thing down in only 4 minutes. That was the quickest boss fight so far, but don't worry, things will get a lot more difficult. Case in point, Chapter 7, where these weird speaker-like enemies can pump us full of hallucinogenic gas, inflicting various negative status ailments. These ailments can quickly stack up and put you at a serious disadvantage, so we prioritise taking these guys out as quickly as possible. 
Other than that, most of the enemies just consist of weak flyers and more of those red Beyblade style tanks, which are quite easy to deal with. Partway through the chapter, we're introduced to our final party member, Brits, who is absolutely amazing in normal playthroughs of this game, but again, pretty useless given the restrictions of this run. To make matters worse, in order to achieve the true ending, you need to build up your social links with this guy. Obviously, I won't spoil the reason why you need to do this, but we need to start chatting to him as much as possible. With our cannon cranked up to level 10, it's time for this game's next main story boss, Mad Scientist Bloodverst. I've seen a lot of people online talk about how this guy is the hardest boss in the entire game, but I've never really understood why. He does have two of these gas spewing enemies with him and can summon more of them in, but other than that, he's pretty straightforward. There is one sneaky trick he likes to pull though, check this out. He charges up his most powerful move for several turns, but just when you think that the turn counter is still at 1, he jabates you by using it immediately, giving you no time to defend and dealing massive damage. It was for that reason we actually failed the first attempt, but on the second try we were ready for his shenanigans and were able to take down both him and his gaseous goons in just 6 minutes. Job done. Chapter 8, The Wind in the Plain We're now approaching the late game, but the scenery is still very bright and vibrant. The art style of this game is actually really nice and acts as a stark juxtaposition to the horrors of war depicted in the game's story. Anyway, there are a few branching paths here, but thankfully it's just more of the same, so I'll save your time and we'll skip ahead to the Chapter 8 boss. Again, it's actually a boss duo. Two flyers, one with yellow grenade launcher clocks and one with blue machine gun clocks. Since our cannoneer Boron isn't either of those and has heavily reduced accuracy against flyers, I have no idea why we're still running him. Like, why didn't I just switch him out? <laughs> I have no idea. But yeah, this can be a pretty intense fight, especially when they start spawning in ground troops, those six-wheeler are fan ricks, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, which Boron can deal with. We get as low as 3700 HP, but do manage to finish off the mob without much of a struggle. Chapter 9, no more unlockable characters or anything, we're now just forced into endless series of battles. Chapters are starting to become incredibly long, especially when you add in the time it takes to explore all of the ruins and those drill enemies are everywhere. Repeated injuries mean that many of our main party members are now being knocked out, so we have to replace them with randos from the bench until we can reach the next intermission so we can revive them using the dormitory. They do gain a decent chunk of XP from resting though, which is nice. We eventually reach the boss, and oh yes, Flam is back, and she's in exactly the same vehicle that we destroyed back in Chapter 5. It's obviously a tougher version, but the gameplay mechanics are exactly the same, so I'll speed up the footage a bit. Inflicting status ailments with socks and destroying her armour with Boron was again the secret to success and as such, she's down once again in just under 6 minutes. Only 3 chapters left. There are a lot more enemies, ruins and branching paths in Chapter 10. If you're like me and enjoy the gameplay, this is great because it's more of what you paid for, but if you reach this part of the game and are starting to get a bit worn out, ah, you might have to keep having breaks because, well, oh, there's still a fair way to go. We keep suffering injuries and even depression, meaning we have to get other characters to talk to our main crew to cheer them up, because apparently one short conversation can cure depression and PTSD, because <laughs> that makes sense. It's here that we have our first experience facing off against enemy leader Hax and his massive tank the Tarascus, which sounds like it'd be a great name for a hot sauce. <laughs> hmm. Sox kicks things off with his link boosting link attack. Then we progress as normal, prioritising the enemy's managam cannon thingy because that thing has the potential to absolutely shred us. Meanwhile, the upper main part of the tank keeps switching weapons, meaning the clock requirements to inflict delays also keep changing. This is a really interesting mechanic that I wish more enemies in the game did, but nah, I think this guy's one of the only two enemies who does it. You'll see the other one in a minute. Disaster strikes 6 minutes into the fight though, as Kyle's link attack fails to finish off the Managarm, resulting in a Ragnarok that deals 
massive damage, injuring our gunners and KOing Boron. Even after switching up the team, there's no way we can recover from that, and Hax deals the exact amount of damage required to finish us off. Second attempt and we start exactly the same way. We got complacent last time. This time we need to exclusively stay focused on that Managam cannon whenever it's online. Sure enough, the fight takes forever, but we never get below 6,000 health. But that's not the last we've seen of this guy, oh no. We've been reunited with our families, but will they come along to help us? <laughs> will they heck? On to chapter 11. I really like the Gasco Underground Passageway, it's visually very different to the other locations and feels kind of magical, especially with those balls of light floating everywhere. The downside of this location? More bloody drills. Ah! <laughs> the annoying part is that in regular playthroughs, these enemies aren't even particularly difficult, but here they're absolutely wrecking our team, because gunners can only take two drills to the face before getting KO'd. So, after beating some more mini-bosses, which now include reskinned, souped-up versions of regular bosses from earlier in the game, as well as, of course, the usual Beyblades, which are now orange for some reason, we've managed to make it to the last node, just before the intermission, with only two reserve characters remaining. We haven't saved the game in over half an hour since you can only save in intermissions. Well, unless you make a one-time use quit-out save. And that's when this happens. Yep dead. That's almost an hour of progress. Oh, those drills really screwed us over. <laughs> Second attempt and I had a cheeky idea. You see, we need to keep our three main gunners alive, because they're higher leveled and have much better relationship links with the three supports. So, whenever a drill is about to hit us in the face, we first swap in some reserve party members to <laughs> tank the damage, then swap back to the main party. The strategy works incredibly well, and we easily make it to the first intermission. The next section mainly consists of a few dangerous battles, followed by endless treasure chest nodes, which is nice, so we get upgrading our gear, ready for the next main story boss. Now, the boss of chapter 11 is a bit of a spoiler, so I'm going to hide their identity whenever their picture or name becomes visible. During the actual fight, they're obviously inside of a tank, so we can't see who they are, so don't worry, no spoilers here. At the start of the fight, all of our heroes are inflicted with depression, meaning all skills are unavailable anyway, as well as the soul cannon being offline. The game's difficulty accounts for that though, meaning this enemy is a fair bit weaker than previous bosses. He or she does have a few decent attacks though, such as Despair here, which inflicts various negative status ailments, but they waste most of their turns just shouting and firing warning shots. Just like hacks, the enemy can change their clock colours, but we just keep the offensive up as usual. The entire fight clocked in at a little over 3 minutes, which was, by a long shot, the easiest and fastest boss fight so far. Time for the final chapter of the game, Chapter 12, From Dawn to Noon on the Sea. We head to a place named Perezia, which has an Eiffel Tower and European architecture, but is totally definitely in no way linked to any real life city, nor the events of any real life wars, which may or may not have involved tank warfare against an evil expanding empire whose nationality is only one letter away from the word Berman. Hmm. Did I mention this game has a French dub option? Hax is back, but as always, we have to get through quite a few waves of enemies in order to reach him. The difficulty seemed to peak in the previous chapter though, because it seems the Burmans are now making their tanks out of cardboard. Kyle does get briefly incapacitated, so we just throw in reservist Brits to temporarily fill the slot. Oh, good to see you Brits. Haven't seen you in a while. Anyway, after resting Kyle in the dormitory and falling through a floor, <laughs> Gotta check those weight limits, people. We're finally ready to face the final boss of the game. Here's our setup going in. We've prioritised getting our armour to rank 16, with two of the three weapon types being only a level behind. We didn't upgrade the machine guns though, instead we used our action points to cook attack, crit and link boost bonuses, since we have no more need for XP boosts. Alright, let's do this. 
If we learned anything from our previous battle with Hax in his mammoth Tarascus sauce tank, it's that we really need to take his Managarm cannon down first, almost without exception. We simply do not have the sustainability nor the firepower to delay this. Then, when it's repairing itself, we can swap over to his main body. Simple in concept, yet difficult in execution. You see, if you recall, the main body's clocks periodically switch colours, always with several of the same colour, so it can be beneficial to occasionally have one of our gunners focus on the main body temporarily in order to get a head start on the clock removal, since we are running all three colours. I really can't be bothered faffing about switching up the team every few turns, so this is what we're going with. As the fight progresses, Hack starts calling in reinforcements in the form of these spherical apparitions, the bluish purplish Tullstorp and the yellow Thorwald. Hey, it's now a 4v3. I call hacks. <laughs> hacks. Get it? Yeah? Oh. Okay then. I honestly have no idea what these spheres even do because they look scary, so I always just instantly take them out. Yes, on one occasion that meant burning through Kyle's link attack when we were at full health, but it was probably worth it. Meh, maybe. What did they even do anyway? And why was there no red sphere? Does that one spawn in later? <laughs> I'm hoping someone in the comments can answer these questions. Whenever I see regenerate full HP recovery, my heart sinks because I keep thinking it means the main body, but it's just the managarm, which we can delay before switching over to the main body for an all-out attack. I've been waiting for this. It's enough to wipe out Hax and blast him into oblivion. Can you beat Fuga Melody of Steel without skills, items, or the Soul Cannon? Yes you can, and it's actually pretty challenging. Let me know if you prefer this style of video showcasing lesser known RPGs, or if you'd rather I just stuck with the well known ones. Meanwhile I better be off because I've just heard that this game has a sequel, alright. See you later everyone, cheers.